The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11995 in the name of Stuart Maxwell on Holocaust Memorial Day 2015. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Stuart Maxwell to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Maxwell. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, on January 27, 1945, 70 years ago today, Soviet soldiers liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest concentration and extermination camp established by the Nazi regime. As the Red Army approached, the Nazis began to evacuate the camp. They killed thousands and forced around another 60,000 prisoners to march out of the camps to move them further from the approaching Soviet forces. As many as 15,000 of those prisoners who were evacuated are estimated to have died as the result of the forced march and the privations they suffered en route to other camps. As a result, there were only around 7,000 prisoners left in Auschwitz when the Red Army arrived, and most of them were desperately ill or dying. As well as moving the prisoners, the guards ordered the crematoria and gas chambers to be destroyed in order to obliterate the evidence of the crimes that had been committed there. They wanted to wipe out the past they wanted to hide the truth. They did this not only at Auschwitz-Birkenau, but at other extermination camps as well. As recently as September of last year, it was reported that archaeologists believe they have found the site of the gas chambers destroyed to hide the truth of what happened at Sobibor. The Holocaust Memorial Trust has published a booklet for Holocaust Memorial Day this year, which lists the path to genocide, and there are eight steps. Step eight, presiding officer, is denial. The perpetrators or later generations deny the existence of any crime. On January 20, 1942, the Van C Conference met to discuss the final solution, the plans to eliminate the Jews. One copy of the Van C Protocol, the minutes of the Van C Conference, survived the war. Here is a portion of the translated minutes. Under proper guidance, in the course of the final solution, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labour in the East. Able-bodied Jews separated according to sex will be taken in large work columns to these areas for work on roads, in the course of which action, doubtless a large portion, will be eliminated by natural causes. The possible final remnant will, since it will undoubtedly consist of the most resistant portion, have to be treated accordingly, because it is the product of natural selection and would, if released, act as the seed of a new Jewish revival. See the experience of history. That translation from which I have just read is the English text of the original German language Vancey Protocol based on the official US government translation prepared for evidence in trials at Nuremberg. There can be no doubt of the chilling meaning of the words which I have just quoted. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is keep the memory alive. And that is very pertinent indeed, as those who survived the Holocaust are now very old. In a few years, the generation that suffered under the Nazi regime will have passed into history and there will be no one alive to say, I saw this, I was there, this really happened. It will be much easier to deny the Holocaust when there are no eyewitnesses left. A Spanish-American called George Santayana said famously, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So it's vital that we never forget the atrocities that took place in the heart of Europe during the 20th century. And today, presenting officer, on this, the 70th anniversary of the very day on which Auschwitz-Birkenau was liberated, I want to say that I believe we should take George Santanyana's warning very seriously indeed. I fear that we are in grave danger of forgetting the past. In Europe, I'm sorry to say, anti-Semitism is on the rise again. We are all only too well aware of the horrific events in Paris earlier this month in which 17 people were murdered, 11 journalists, two police officers and four people shopping in a kosher supermarket. In July 2014, eight synagogues in France were attacked. Indeed, one in Sarcelles was firebombed by a mob said to be 400 strong. And in Berlin, Molotov cocktails were thrown into the Bergisch synagogue in Wuppertal, which had previously been destroyed during Kristallnacht. In May 2014, in Brussels, four people were murdered at the Jewish Museum. In Toulouse in 2012, three children and a teacher were murdered at a Jewish school, a few days after the same gunman had murdered three French soldiers. Of course, these attacks were by murderous individuals and not organised campaigns by a government. They were universally condemned across Europe. However, in November 2012, a member of the Hungarian parliament, a Jobbik MP, said officials of Jewish origin should be listed because they might be, and I want to quote here, they might be a national security risk. 
He was, I'm very glad to say, condemned roundly, but these are worrying times. Here in Scotland, thankfully, there have been no such terrible incidents as I have listed from the continent. However, there is room for no complacency either. In August 2013, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, SCOJEC, issued a report which they had produced with Scottish Government funding entitled Being Jewish in Scotland. And this report found that the experience of Jewish people living in Scotland is largely positive, which is good news. But it also found that there is, however, some anti-Semitism which continues to, be, uh, to create a sense of insecurity. In answers to written questions which I tabled, the Scottish Government indicated that in 2011-12, recorded religious hate crimes against Judaism were running at 2.2 charges per thousand members of the Jewish community. And in 12-13, recorded religious hate crimes against Judaism were, I'm sorry to say, running at 4.19 charges per thousand members of the Jewish community, eh, almost double. In the three months between August 2014 and the start of November 14, more than 50 anti-Semitic incidents were reported to the Scottish police, exceeding the total for the previous three years. The Scottish Government has responded to this sudden rise in anti-Semitic incidents in a most positive manner by funding a short-term survey to be entitled How Being Jewish in Scotland Has Changed, which will report at the end of March. And only last week in the Chamber, the First Minister stated that tackling anti-Semitism is a key priority for the Scottish Government. She also stated that the Jewish community in Scotland plays a massive role in this country and makes a massive contribution. We are proud of that and we should all stand shoulder to shoulder with it at this time. I'd like to echo those words of the First Minister. Presenting officer, it's vital that we in Scotland all stand together, that we do not isolate any member of our Scottish community, that we value the contribution that all of us make to Scotland and that we remember that we must all stand together because for hatred to succeed, it must isolate the object of hatred and separate them from the rest of the community. We must always remember, but not just in a quiet way. We must state loudly and clearly that the Holocaust happened in order that we stop those who would attempt to wipe it from the record books. President, President Officer, we must never ever forget the past and I commend the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust for keeping the memory alive. Many thanks. Before we move on to the open debate, can I just advise the Chamber that due to the number of members who have indicated that they would like to speak in this debate, I am amended to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I invite Stuart Maxwell to move such a motion. Uh, move, President Officer. Many thanks. The question is then that members are agreed to extend the debate this evening. Are you so agreed? Members are. Thank you. Ken McIntosh now pleased to be followed by Kenneth Gibson and if, we, if members could try to keep to speeches of four minutes I'd be grateful. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by thanking Stuart Maxwell for bringing forward today's motion and for giving the Parliament an opportunity uh, to commemorate and reflect once more on the events of the Holocaust. It is a, a full 70 years since the liberation of Auschwitz and yet each year the power of those events the horror of our capacity for evil, interspersed with all too occasional glimpses of humanity, makes me think afresh. Holocaust Memorial Day each year fills me with questions and with hope and anxiety in equal measure as to whether we have learned our lessons. This year was no exception. When I heard again the stories of Bob Kuttner and of Henry and Ingrid Wooger, Holocaust survivors who have made their home and brought up their families here in Scotland. Listening to Bob talk to a group of senior pupils at one of his own local schools last week, I was struck this time not so much by the scars he must bear, the family he lost or the damage wrought on his own life, when he was barely a teenager himself for that matter, but on his warmth, his hope and his lack of bitterness. In a similar vein, there was a fascinating documentary on television also last week, specifically on the scenes filmed following the liberation of Auschwitz by the Russians. This time, the contrast with the shocking brutality was a dated and, and frankly rather sexist commentary about powers of recovery. According to the voiceover, within three weeks of liberation, many of the women in the camp were rejuvenated to the point about worrying, worrying over their hairstyle and their choice of clothes. As I say, the commentary was very much of its time, but the point that really struck home was about the resilience of those survivors. Each year, when we mark the Holocaust, 
The story of those events gives me a fresh perspective. And this year, it seems to have been one of the hope that survives our despair. Yet another example of exactly that was the story of Jane Haining, the Scottish missionary who ended up dying in Auschwitz because she refused to leave her Jewish pupils in Budapest. I think uh, members here, like me, will have been able to see the documentary that was shown in East Renfrewshire last night. And it was a powerful and moving film. Jane's quiet and unassuming heroism provided a welcome counterbalance to the fatalism and the powerlessness that the Holocaust can often evoke. At a time when our own communities are under strain from growing inequality and continuing injustice, often expressed in terms of prejudice and hate, uh, when we face yet another rise in anti-Semitism accurately described by Stuart Maxwell, it has never been more important that, than it is now to con continue to learn the lessons of the Holocaust. I'm aware, as I'm sure we all are this, uh, in this chamber, that soon there will be no survivors to share their memories directly with us. It is up to us, to the young Holocaust ambassadors who spoke so elo eloquently at lunchtime today in addressing mm -hmm. the Parliament, to keep those memories alive. There is so much we have still to learn. I do not believe that we could pay a greater tribute to the sacrifice of so many than to show we remain willing learners. Many thanks. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jackson Carlaw. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd first like to thank Stuart Maxwell for lodging this motion and securing debating time on this important day, the 70th anniversary of when Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau and discovered a vast factor of death with all the horrors of mass extermination, slave labour and medical experimentation. Remembering man's inhumanity to man at its most extreme presents an opportunity for us to educate communities throughout Scotland about the tragedies that occurred in occupied Europe, which saw 12 million men, women and children die at the hands of the Nazi regime, half of them Jewish, simply for being Jewish. In 1933, the Jewish population of Germany stood at 600,000, less than 1% of the total population. However, the Jewish population around Europe numbered more than 10 million in countries later occupied in whole or in part by the Nazis. Once in power, Hitler staged an economic boycott against Jewish-owned shops and businesses. Jews were removed from their employment and professions, making life increasingly unbearable. Many Jews tried to emigrate if they could find a country to take them. Few would. France, the Netherlands and Romania all set up camps to intern Jews fleeing Nazi rule. Even the kind of transport which allowed Jewish children to come to Britain left their parents to an unknown fate. Jews were targeted earlier in the, early in the war. German officials confiscated Jewish property and required Jews to wear identifying armbands. Local collaborators often assisted the Nazis by robbing and persecuting Jews, although one should remember there are more than 25,000 righteous Gentiles who risked their lives to help Jewish friends, neighbours and even strangers. The final solution, a euphemistic term was used to refer to the annihilation, the genocide of the Jewish people. In 1941, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, mobile SS and police killing squads massacred Jewish communities either immediately or soon after deporting them to ghettos. Operation Reinhardt established killing centres in Poland at Chelmno, Bilzec, Sobibor and Treblinka for the sole purpose of murdering Jews, men, women and children. In these centres of 1.7 million Jews who arrived, only 106 are known to have survived the war. Auschwitz-Birkenau subsequently became the main centre for destroying the Jewish people. Around a million Jews of many nationalities were transported from across Europe to be either killed upon arrival a certainty for the old, young and sick, or worked to death on minuscule rations. Around 100,000 others were also killed, mostly Roma, Poles or Soviet prisoners of war. Towards the final months of the war, as the Red Army advanced, inmates were sent either by train or on foot in death marches, forced to tread across the chaos of a collapsing Nazi regime to prevent their liberation. The few thousand left at Auschwitz were to be murdered, but the rapid Soviet advance prompted the SS to flee to save their own skins. And this year, as both Stuart Maxwell and Ken McIntosh have pointed out, maybe the last significant anniversary will be marked by Holocaust survivors, given their rapidly advancing age and infirmity. So in years to come, we must remember for them. Of course, the Jews were not the first people to face genocide in the 20th century. 
Who remembers the Armenians, Hitler said, of the people murdered in 1915 in the dying days of the Ottoman Empire? At least 1.3 million people, more than half the world's Armenian population at that time, were killed in modern independent Armenia, where many of the survivors fled to, is but a tenth of the size of historic Armenia. Presiding officer, 1945 is a determination to prevent something as dreadfully unique as the industrialised slaughter of the Holocaust from ever happening again. Yet there have been other genocides in Rwanda and Cambodia. And in Islamic State, the Yazidi culture is threatened with extinction now. Perhaps we will never live in a world without such horrors, but whenever and wherever possible, we must fight against inhumanity and intolerance. Uh, that the, the Holocaust reminds us is so much part of our human story. Holocaust Memorial Day makes it clear why we must do so. Many thanks. Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, presiding officer, today, Holocaust Memorial Day, January the 27th, marks the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, in which one and a quarter million souls from across Europe perished, young and old, male and female, Jew and Gentile, murdered without compunction by a barbarous Nazi tyranny. Last Saturday evening, among many commemorative programmes on television and radio, Channel 4 broadcast an extraordinary documentary, Holocaust, Night Will Fall. It tells the story of the filmmakers who, in the immediate aftermath of the war, filmed the liberation of the various death camps. It was film that was suppressed until now because geopolitical uh, tides shifted and it was felt inappropriate and inconvenient for the film to be seen at the time. I learned fresh from it. I didn't know, for example, that much of the footage we see of Auschwitz was refilmed sometime after the liberation, but not so the British liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And despite everything I've seen over the years, I remain stupefied all over again to see stuff that I never thought possible and had never previously seen screened. That film is going to be released later this year in cinemas and in DVD. And to touch on something Stuart Maxwell said, because the denial business was all well, really well established at that point, the British contingent insisted that local people were filmed witnessing the events so that they could not subsequently deny what had been seen. The Jewish community in East Renfrewshire, where I live and grew up, is of long standing. In his magnificent biographical trilogy, which commenced in 1986 with Growing Up in the Gorbals, Ralph Glasser memorably traced the arrival and integration of Scotland's Jewish community in and around Glasgow over a century ago. As the community migrated south to Newton Mearns in the post-war years, members of it became my neighbours and friends. And I learned very little from them about the horrors endured, although many of them had personally survived or personally lost family as the European genocide unfolded. What I didn't know is that was also true within families, not just between neighbours and friends. Within families, they kept silent. In many cases, because the horror of what they endured had been so great, but also horribly out of shame that they had survived and were unable to come to terms with that fact or of discussing it. And it's also true, unfortunately, in those post-war years in Britain, anti-Semitism persisted in ignorance. It was two landmark television programmes in 1973 which together transformed public understanding, and certainly mine. Jeremy Isaacs' 26-part World at War uh, and The Outstanding Ascent of Man, presented by Dr Jacob Bronowski. I can vividly remember Dr Bronowski's testimony as he stood ankle-deep in water, and in his mind, water mingled with the ashes of his people in the ruins of Auschwitz-Birkenau, intensely moved and speaking directly to the ca camera. That footage is readily available on YouTube, and I watched it again recently. It's still as powerful as it was 40 years ago. And if you've not seen it, then please look at it. Or also the remarkable interview he gave just before he died to Michael Parkinson. Like others, I visited Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I did so privately a few years ago. It's a desolate place, and I visited it at the bleakest time of year. My guide was the grandson of a local Oswissium family. He was full of compassion, and to be a guide on that site, you would have to be. As a father, to see the photographs of small children skipping with joy and relief after the confines of a long train journey, and what father has not been in that position. But to know that they were skipping, holding hands, and smiling along a short path to their execution is as chilling and moving an image as any. It's an uncomfortable truth, simply not admitted to enough, that much of occupied Europe was complicit in sending the Jews to their deaths. Any cursory study demonstrates that the defense of ignorance is shallow, but it suits precious sensibilities that this fiction be maintained. Far too many people in occupied or Axis Europe knew exactly what was going on, and far too few raised any hand to stop it. 
In this country, we were never, never called upon by an invading Nazi machine to be complicit. We resisted invasion and helped win the war. But I believe all our island character and history would have seen individuals and communities stand and resist. In the event, only two Britons and the occupied Channel Islands were shipped under cover of darkness and transported by sea and train across a continent to Auschwitz to be murdered at their journey's end. What madness was that? Yet 70 years later, as evidenced horribly in Paris a fortnight ago, anti-Semitism is finding a voice again. It must be confronted, challenged and defeated. 50, 70 years ago, Auschwitz was liberated. 50 years ago, Churchill died. Let me end with a quote from him. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing great or small, large or petty. Never give in and accept the convictions of honour and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Presiding officer, 70 years ago, Britain did not yield. 70 years on, Scotland will not. Thank you. And I now call Graham Day to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I begin by congratulating Stuart Maxwell on securing this opportunity to reflect upon the Holocaust and apologise that owing to the extension of the debate, I may have to leave the chamber before it concludes. The, the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau 70 years ago today and 1946, the year in which genocide was deemed to be a crime under international law, are a very, very long time ago. So in a world, the ever-changing and evolving nature of which at times is breathtaking, it's somehow reassuring that the Holocaust still resonates today, particularly amongst two, perhaps even three generations that weren't even born then. Because it is so important that we remember the atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, not only those involving the six million Jews who were murdered, but the five million others. Gay people, gypsies, priests, people with physical or mental disabilities, communists, trade unionists, resistance fighters, Jehovah's Witnesses, anarchists, Poles and other Slavic people were all sent to the concentration camps. An estimated 1.5 million Romani gypsies perished under the Parajmos. And whilst the atrocities perpetrated in the Jews were acknowledged quite quickly at the end of World War II, it took until the 1970s for the West German Parliament to acknowledge this particular persecution had been racially motivated. Since World War II, of course, other acts of genocide, not on the same scale, of course, but nevertheless utterly horrific, have unfortunately been committed across the world in Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur and Cambodia, where the Khmer Rouge slogan was, to spare you is no profit, to destroy you is no loss. And that attitude towards life, some 30 years on from the liberation of Auschwitz, mirrored the horrors of the Nazi regime, under whom, as the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust website recalls, it was possible to be shot for knowing a foreign language, for wearing glasses, laughing or crying. Who would have escaped these criteria in Nazi Germany or indeed Cambodia? But it's important here that we focus on the Holocaust and the persecution of Jewish people, especially in light of recent uh, events in France. Uh, and reflecting upon the horrors of the Holocaust, we should also consider the incredible acts of life-saving bravery on the part of individuals who felt com uh, compelled to intervene. I want, if I may, presiding officer, to highlight briefly the story of Dr. Feng Shan Ho, a Chinese diplomat in Vienna at the time of the Anschluss. So appalled was he by what he was witnessing, Dr. Ho issued visas, visas to any Jews who wanted them for anywhere so that he had the means to flee the Nazis. His superior, the Chinese ambassador in Berlin, tried to stop the practice as he didn't want China diplomatic relations with Germany put at risk, but Dr. Ho stood firm. We don't know precisely how many visas he issued, but it's estimated it was in the thousands. The support that he'd given to Jewish people during the Holocaust only became known after Dr. Ho's death in 1997, when Vad Yashim awarded him the title of Righteous Among Nations for his humanitarian courage. As we mark the 70th anniversary of the ending of the Holocaust, it is, as I touched upon earlier in my contribution, um, important uh, that young people, the adults of tomorrow, learn about it and the lessons that should be derived from what occurred. I'm therefore pleased that all five high schools in my constituency are undertaking work to commemorate the Holocaust, including having survivors uh, speak to pupils and pupils and staff who've visited Auschwitz addressing assemblies as well as reaching out to feeder primaries to share that experience. President officer, can I conclude by noting the importance of the lessons from the Holocaust programme? Because by ensuring that two peoples from every school and college can visit Auschwitz, we can respond to the trust concern that hearing is not seeing. And I want to close with remarks from one such pupil, Rona Lingard from Webster's High School in Kerry Muir, who visited Auschwitz in September. Rona said, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We can't just remember what happened. We need to learn from it and teach others about it. I think that sums things up rather appropriately, presiding officer. Many thanks.
<coughs> Excuse me, and I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And like others, can I start by uh, congratulating Stuart Maxwell uh, on securing this debate on the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. He has brought similar debates to the Chamber now on a number of occasions, and, and once again, I believe he set the, the scene and the tone absolutely perfectly. I, I, a couple of years ago, took part in the equivalent debate to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. I recall being moved by the contributions made by uh, a number of members, uh, as indeed I have been uh, again this evening. Many had, unlike myself, had visited Auschwitz, Belzen, uh, Dachau, or, or, or one of the other camps, and were able to draw on that experience and the way it made them feel. Interestingly, most spoke of their sense of surprise at how they'd responded uh, to their first visit to one of those camps. Strange, perhaps, given that so much of the detail and the enormity of the Holocaust are matters of now long-established record. However, I think it reflects the capacity of the Holocaust and the unimaginable brutality involved to reach down through the years and affect us in ways we do find surprising and unsettling. We heard that again today at Time for Reflection from uh, Lucy Patterson and Kieran Smith. How could anyone act in this way towards their fellow man? Why did nobody speak up more loudly at the time? And how should we judge those who knew but did not act, even if they did not know the full extent of what was happening? All legitimate questions, but we should not delude ourselves into thinking of this as solely an act of historical remembrance, important though that is. There are sadly numerous more recent examples that suggest that the lessons of history have not been learned even if these do not match the scale of what happened during the Holocaust. This year, for example, also marks the 20th anniversary of the atrocities that took place in Srebrenica in 1995, a genocide of over 8,000 Bosnians, mainly men and boys, that represents the largest mass killing of European, on European soil since the Second World War. While people did speak out, people did resolve to take action, and efforts have been made to hold accountable those responsible. Nevertheless, half a century on from the liberation of Auschwitz, it was a sobering reminder of the fact that such barbaric acts are not consigned to history, nor indeed was the international response at the time above criticism. Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur and Syria, as Graham Day uh, alluded to, all stand as poignant reminders that, as Robert Burns would have observed, the capacity of man's inhumanity to man remains undiminished. I think the Holocaust Educational Trust is to be warmly commended for their efforts in trying to reinforce this message with successive generations and with no little success. The Trust also does great work in translating what to many is unimaginable horror on a truly mass scale and reminds us that it is made up of many millions of individual tra tragedies that demand to be remembered and acknowledged for what they are. Last time I participated in this debate, the theme for Memorial Day, drawing on Martin Niemöller's powerfully uh, evocative poem, First They Came, was about speaking up and speaking out. It stressed how important it is for all of us to use our voice to challenge what we see and know to be wrong, whether that be anti-Semitism, bigotry, racism or intolerance. The theme for the major anniversary this year is memory, and I was delighted to hear that pupils and staff at Kirkwall Grammar School in my Orkney constituency once again have been heavily involved in commemorative events. This week, uh, there will be the customary candle lighting ceremony at KGS taking place in a room that has been transformed by S2 and three pupils to include a black remembrance window wall. This is covered with stars of David containing messages of remembrance and, as Ken McIntosh uh, suggested, of hope. Yellow stars have also been hung in the main foyer of the school as a poignant reminder of the Holocaust, re representing the stars worn by Jews in concentration camps. Of course, it was not simply Jews who were singled out. Red stars were worn by political prisoners, including trade unionists, purple by Jehovah's Witnesses and members of small religious minorities. Homosexuals were singled out with pink badges, while black was reserved for those who didn't fit in, including the mentally ill, alcoholics, the homeless and pacifists. Brown identified the Roma people. Many would argue that some of those persecuted by the Nazis continue to suffer prejudice and discrimination now. So while it is right that we should remember, we should also redouble our commitment to speak out loudly and act decisively. This is not always easy or comfortable. Recent events in Paris highlight the tensions that exist. 
Many Muslims who utterly condemn the brutal killings at Charlie Hebdo nevertheless feel aggrieved at what they see as the freedom to lampoon the Prophet Muhammad with strict laws on anti-Semitism and denying the Holocaust. This presents a real challenge to those of us who passionately defend the right of free speech. But the only way of charting a path through these troubled times is by committing to tolerance, education and debate and never losing sight of the lessons from our past. In that regard, can I again commend the Holocaust Memorial Trust on the contribution they have and continue to make and thank Stuart Maxwell once again for allowing this Parliament an opportunity to debate and to commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day. Okay. Thank you very much. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. And like others, I would like to begin and firstly like to congratulate Stuart Maxwell for securing this important members' debate and bringing it to the Chamber tonight. Today is the day for everyone to pause to pause and remember the six million Jewish men, women and children murdered by the Nazi regime in occupied Europe. However, presiding officer, it wasn't just Jewish people that were killed. The site was also a death place for many Poles, Russians, socialists, communists, Christians, homosexuals, mentally and physically disabled people and people from the Roma community. All were the direct victims of the hate and sectarianisms by the Nazi. Today, survivors will lay wreaths and light candles at the so-called death wall at Block 11 on January the 27th to mark 70 years since the camp's liberation in memory of those who never left. We need to recognise that genocide does not just take place on its own. It has a steady process which can begin if discrimination, racism and hatred are not checked, tackled and prevented. Events are taking, across, taking place across the UK to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. In my own constituency, Glasgow, there will be a memorial meeting tonight in the STUC building in Glasgow. The main aim of these meetings is not only to remember the victims of the Holocaust and why it happened, but also to draw attention to the modern day threat of fascism and racism, which is on the rise across Europe and in Britain. Holocaust Memorial Day is always an important event in the area, as Glasgow is a home to a large Jewish community. Speaking at the meeting tonight will be two of the Glasgow girls, Amal Azuddin and Rosa Salih, I hope that I pronounced them properly, along with community activist Pinar Askew. All three were part of a trade union sponsored delegation on a recent United Against Fascism Holocaust Memorial trip to Auschwitz concentration camp. They will be giving a report of their experiences of visiting the camps. I regret that I'm not able to be at the STUC tonight to hear the personal reflections of those young people and how their trip affected them. But I will aim to catch up with them as soon as I can to hear about their experience. Earlier on today, we heard from um, students Lucy Patterson and Kieran Smith, two pupils from St Andrews RC Secondary School in Glasgow, who delivered an excellent and moving contribution at a time for reflection. And as my colleague Ken McIntosh illustrated their journeys and experiences earlier. In conclusion, presiding officer, we have come a long way since the liberation of Outswich 70 years ago. We would think that after the revelation of such dreadful crimes, those who voiced the same views as the Nazis could never gain votes or any credibility again. But sadly, the spectre of fascism haunts Europe once more. People with fascist views are being selected and elected in parts of Europe. And after recent events in Germany and France, more than ever across Europe, we must learn the lessons of history. All those who believe in freedom and democracy and who oppose racism and fascism must stand together united in order to ensure that the horrors of Auschwitz never happen again. Keep the memory alive and never forget. Enable and support our young ambassadors of the Holocaust Educational Trust Auschwitz Project who aim to keep their memory alive of the visits enable and support them to keep the memory alive 
and never forget. Thank you. Um, and I call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Colin Q. Presiding officer, can I begin by thanking Stuart Maxwell for bringing this debate to the chamber today, which is appropriately not only Holocaust Memorial Day 2015, but as other colleagues have acknowledged, also marks the liberation of Auschwitz Birkenau trans uh, concentration camp where over one million Jews were exterminated. In November last year, Yad Vashem World Centre for Holocaust Research, Documentation, Education and Communication in Israel, in partnership with the Council of Christians and Jews, embarked on a pilot programme consisting of a visit for politicians to Israel to the centre. The politicians were drawn from different parties representing approximately every tier of government across the United Kingdom. I had the privilege of being invited and taking part in this pilot programme, which included a three-day varied programme with seminars, discussions and a tour of Yad Vashem and its features. Interestingly, the programme also included a visit to Ramallah in Palestine. The Yad Vashem Centre has an impressive and compelling air of tranquility, situated as it is on a hillside with a panoramic vista of Bethlehem. The centre itself and throughout the campus contains poignant memorials as well as providing opportunities for interactive engagement and analytical discussions. It is therefore very much a living and working centre. Amongst its features, there are the Holocaust Historia, History Museum and the heart-wrenching Hall of Names containing the names and personal details of millions of victims recorded on pages of testimony filled out by survivors and many of their loved ones. The Museum of Holocaust Art exhibits the world's largest collection of art created in the ghettos, camps, hideouts and other places where artistic endeavour was well nigh impossible. And here the tenacity and bravery of the human spirit is clear for all to see. Meanwhile, the visitor centre enables groups like our party or individuals to look at documentaries, films and survivor testimonies on screen. In particular, I find the Learning Centre both challenging and enlightening, presenting as it does the opportunity to explore historic, them thematic and moral dilemmas related to the Holocaust. For example, I understood how important family was to the, the Jewish community and how this in turn often meant that they couldn't take flight, even when they knew danger was imminent because it would mean leaving grandparents or other members of their family behind. And they quite simply weren't prepared to do this. The group was also privileged to go behind the scenes and see how the centre gathers and forensically analyses historical artefacts using state-of-the-art technologies to decipher even minuscule and damaged material. Consequently, items which may seem to the casual observer as meaningless scrap are recognised for the potential value they have in connecting an individual who perished in the Holocaust with their family, who still may not even have any concrete proof of what happened to their loved one. Presiding officer, I recommend this programme to anyone in the Parliament who has the opportunity to take part, for it is imperative that we never forget the extensive atrocities committed by the Nazi regime. I therefore commend the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust and their commitment to ensure ensuring that we remember the horror and learn from the Holocaust. Many thanks. And I now call Colin Keir. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I also add my congratulations to Stuart Maxwell in bringing forward this debate. The 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau death camps, I cannot think of a more appropriate day to commemorate, commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day. The attempted wiping out in Europe of not just Jews, but others such as Sinti and Roma Gypsies has proved to be some of the most shameful acts in modern times, if not in the history of mankind. 
Add the crimes against humanity in Cambodia, Srebrenica and Rwanda, it's almost like the world hasn't listened to the warnings of the early part of the 20th century. And I fully commend the support and work being carried out by the Holocaust Memorial Trust and the Holocaust Education Trust. It's vital that younger generations are taught about the vile actions of the Nazis and their followers from the 1930s until 1945. The education of our younger people, I would like to think, will enable them to identify the type of laws which can only lead to persecution of smaller groups. And the Nazi Nuremberg laws are a good case in point. I was born 14 years after the end of the Second World War and growing up here in Scotland through the 60s, when we only had either two or three uh, TV channels, it meant we had no shortage of war films on BBC One, Two and ITV. It was my childhood view of war. But it was only later in my teens in the 70s I really found out about the atrocities in the concentration camps and death camps organised by the Nazis. But there was a limit to what you knew or really understood. And perhaps I got a bit more knowledgeable when I was doing my hires. But again, these atrocities were way before my time. The full impact of what happened hit me fairly recently, in fact. Over the past five years since I began visiting friends in Berlin, I initially came across places accidentally which would hold a great deal of fear to any Jews in the area all those years ago. Travelling on Berlin's S-Bahn, we stopped at Grunewald Station on the west of the city. Looking around, seeing some tiled buildings which were obviously seen uh, themselves through the war and had been kept, and I was quite impressed by the sense of history uh, in the architecture, given that 80% of the city had been destroyed. I pointed this out to my friend, who then looked at me and pointed and said, this is where the Berlin Jews were told to report to what they thought was going to be a new life in the East. It's at this point that the penny really dropped with me, and I can genuinely say that my heart sank. This was no grainy black and white TV documentary or even a new colour film on the History Channel. This was living history. The sense of being on the site with the cattle trucks, the mass of people being directed by SS guards, and the knowledge of most of, that most of these human beings would never return had a profound effect. I found myself on subsequent visits to the city having similar feelings. When seeing the inauspicious building used by Adolf Eichmann, that he used when planning the journeys of these poor souls, the victims of the final solution. Why had I known about this period of history but not really felt or understood it? Living history is about visiting, talking about what happened and really understanding why it happened. Attending a Bruce Springsteen concert back in the mid-80s, he said in a preamble to a song that blind faith in your leaders will get you killed. Well, perhaps the Jews, Sinti and Roma peoples didn't sign up to Nazism, but many others did, and millions paid the price. Seventy years ago, and it's not that long ago, and genocide has happened since. Evil hasn't gone away, but the world must do what it can to identify and do something about it, and I support and commend this motion. Many thanks. That concludes the open debate and I now invite Dr Alistair Allen to respond to the debate. Dr Allen, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Stuart Maxwell uh, for again bringing a motion on Holocaust Memorial Day to be discussed at this member's debate and also thank the many members uh, who have taken part. From Shetland to the border, schools, colleges, universities, faith groups and communities are, as we speak, remembering uh, this particularly significant Holocaust Memorial Day, with candle lighting ceremonies, memorial events, music, drama and poetry. And I'd like to thank the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and Interfaith Scotland for their partnership in organising the commemorative programme of events this week. I'd also like to thank the Holocaust Educational Trust for placing the Book of Commitment in the Parliament this week and for the outstanding work I know they do. In October 2011, I had the privilege to take part in a school's visit to Auschwitz organised by the Lessons from Auschwitz project, which is funded by the Scottish Government and run by the Holocaust Educational Trust. It is an experience that I will not readily forget, uh, and neither will the many young people who were with me that day forget it. 
It has often been said that the only appropriate thing to say upon visiting Auschwitz is to say nothing at all. Anything we might offer to say would be inadequate. Indeed, different people are taken aback by different things. For some people, the most shocking thing about seeing Auschwitz-Birkenau is its sheer scale. It is the size of a small town. For some, it is trying to work out how the camp commandant apparently cheerfully had his wife and children living in a comfortable house on site. And for others, it is the photographs of lost families or left house keys or the piles of shoes and hair. All of this rehumanizes what happened and makes sense, if that is possible, of vast numbers by focusing on individual victims. So the Scottish Government is pleased to have been able to fund these opportunities for senior pupils from Scottish schools for some six years now, since 2009. And as a result, well over 2,000 school pupils have had the experience of visiting Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it is, of course, not only uh, that experience that is so powerful. The Lessons from Auschwitz programme supports young people to go on to become ambassadors for the project. And as today's motion mentions, two of those ambassadors, uh, Lucy Patterson and Kieran Smith from St Andrews Secondary in Glasgow, uh, led, I understand, a very moving and eloquent time for reflection at the start of our session today. These and other ambassadors can teach us about the vital importance of understanding and respecting different religions and beliefs, the importance of understanding those who are of a different race or of a different sexual orientation, because the Holocaust teaches us very disturbingly about where intolerance of all kinds, and of course specifically, as Ken McIntosh and others have pointed out, where specifically anti-Semitism leads us all. As we have heard, the theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is keep the memory alive. Ella Weisberger, a Holocaust survivor, and Hassan Hasanovic, a Srebrenica survivor, are travelling throughout this week, sharing their testimonies with young people, uh, with community groups and others. And across Scotland, uh, people young and old will be pledging to keep the memory alive, giving a voice to those whose voices were brutally silenced in genocides. Tonight in air, the First Minister will join survivors, students, local and national politicians, uh, communities and faith groups, including the Jewish community, at the National Holocaust Memorial Day event. Tomorrow in Glasgow, around 400 primary seven to uh, sixth year secondary pupils from across the city will be involved in their own pupil-led Holocaust Memorial Day event. Schools, colleges and universities will involve students, lecturers and communities in a variety of events, including sharing stories and reflections. Uh, a University of the Highlands and Islands candle lighting ceremony will take place through a live link up across uh, the university's campuses, including those on the islands of Benbecula and Barra in my own constituency. All divisions of Police Scotland are marking Holocaust Memorial Day. And this morning, Falkirk Council hosted uh, an event which included a mix of song, film and poetry by local community groups, telling the stories of the Gypsy and Roma, uh, religious, uh, political, lesbian and gay communities, experiences of the Holocaust. Parliament on Thursday is hosting a reception for survivors and their families, including those who came to Glasgow as part of the kinder transport. The reception will commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day and will also celebrate the enormous contribution uh, that migrant communities have made over successive generations to make Scotland uh, the successful and diverse country it is today, a point made uh, in a very uh, thoughtful contribution from Jackson Carlaw. Keeping the memory alive means, of course, not only learning about the Holocaust, uh, but learning from the Holocaust. It means learning the lessons of our past. Uh, to do that, we need to fully understand where intolerance and prejudice take us. We must never be complacent about intolerance and hatred. We must challenge and eradicate all forms of discrimination and prejudice wherever we can. And as many have observed tonight, uh, the recent and tragic events in Paris should remind us all of the need for vigilance. Thank you again for the opportunity to contribute to this members' debate, presiding officer. Uh, members have reflected their personal commitment to education 
and commemoration of the Holocaust and of other genocides. As Mr Maxwell uh, and Mr Gibson mentioned, there will come a time when there will be no living witnesses to testify to these crimes. So we all of us have a responsibility to keep the memory alive and to continue to support the important, heartfelt, meaningful activities we have seen throughout our country today. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes Stuart Maxwell's debate on Holocaust Memorial Day 2015. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>